Hello, everyone. We're going to have fun tonight. It's another Live with CCO. We're at episode number 92. And we're going to have fun because we're going to do some case studies. I really love our case studies. We don't do them um, live like this as often as maybe we could. But because of that, uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to show you how we work with case studies is because the new course that we're launching has, it, it's almost, you know, 98% all case studies. And it's an advanced coding course. Uh, we'll tell you more about it at the end. However, there was some questions that came in about coding for obstetrics or OBGYN. So I picked two case studies and we're going to walk through them and I'm going to show you how to abstract, how to look for the, uh, the code within the case and know that this is the type of study that we do with our new advanced course. So if this resonates with you and you want to get involved with how we um, educate for an o more advanced um, picking of, or abstracting, picking the codes to the highest specificity and talking about the disease process uh, along the way, that might be something you'll be interested in. And hey, we're on TikTok now. We just uh, joined TikTok. Uh, I am not a, a person that was on TikTok very much, but we were going to give it a try. If you're on TikTok, the link is there and you can uh, go in and like what we've put up so far and look for more things in the future. Uh, we are eh, mostly heavy in social media on our YouTube, because you know we've been in there for a decade, uh, but we're also on LinkedIn and Facebook, now TikTok and Instagram and some of those others. So keep an eye out for us. OBGYN medical coding cases and studies. That's what uh, we've picked tonight because we've had some questions about that. Uh, we are gonna keep this up in YouTube. So if you want to go back and reference later, know that it'll still be there. Feel free to share with your friends too and your peers or your colleagues or if you know somebody that struggles with this particular area, maybe what we go over tonight, just little tidbits and highlights will be beneficial to them. We always like for uh, other people to find out about us via word of mouth. I have two case studies. We're gonna do a female cyst. And we're also gonna do a cesarean delivery. The first case study, uh, let me go ahead and downsize this so we can get right in it. Hopefully you'll be able to see this all right. Oops, there we go. I thought, why is it coming up? Uh, this is a... Um, inpatient chart, and uh, we're not doing any PCS. This will be CPT codes. However, know that this is the type of documentation you're going to see. When I first start looking at documentation, I want to make sure all the information is correct. Now, of course, this is redacted, made up names, because this is a case study in the textbook that we use. And um, uh, so any of the names are, are fictional. Now, let's see here. This particular patient, we would want to verify the name before we start plugging in codes and, and uh, that everything's accurate. We have an attending physician, Dr. Green, and a surgeon, Dr. Martinez. The next thing that you're going to look at is the pre- and post-op diagnosis or diagnoses, depending on how many there are. This is a large left ovarian cyst. What are they going to do? Probably they're going to get rid of the cyst. Uh, the next thing that we do, if you're, it, depending on what your role is, uh, say if you're doing risk adjustment, um, you'll start looking at signatures and make sure this is a valid uh, encounter that you can uh, code off of. 
for in-house, again, there's different rules for different people. So depending on at, at what stage you'll be pulling the codes, they may have you preemptively pulling the codes before it's signed off on and then double checking and nodding it after that. Again, everybody has different workflows and procedures. Uh, so the, the, really the first thing that I want to do is uh, see if the pre-op and the post-op match and it does. If not, do, don't assume that the pre-op and the post-op is going to match. Uh, if they had gotten in there and they looked at um, the cyst and they found endometriosis, like they, they thought, well, we're only going to see the cyst. And that's what our focus is. But they get in there and they say, oh, my, there's endometriosis here. Then the post-op could have additional diagnoses or the diagnosis could be changed. Maybe this isn't an ovarian cyst like they thought. They got in and got a better view and it was actually a neoplasm or something. Usually they know ahead of times because the imaging is so good. But again, uh, those are things to be aware of. Pre-op and post-op need to um, be noted to see if there's any change. Then the procedure. What's the procedure that's being done? Uh, a laparoscopic drainage of the left paratubal cyst. Now, think about this. They're going on in to take care of a cyst. They are draining the cyst. Are they removing the cyst or draining the cyst? The procedure that was performed, that's past tense, is saying that they only drained the cyst. A lot of times they take them out. That makes a difference in the codes that you're picking. Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to just highlight things that I think are pertinent along the way. Let's pick a pretty color uh, since we're doing highlight. Uh, my favorite color is green, so we're going to pick that. How old the patient is does not matter unless you're doing procedures where the patient is uh, extreme ages. Sometimes codes will change for extreme age, and um, this this is not one of those procedures, but be very mindful of that. Uh, they will always say uh, whether it's male, female, and um, the age of the patient. Then it'll go straight into the introduction of what the plan is uh, for uh, note. This is not uh, necessarily definitive information. Uh, this is a summation of, hey, this is what's going on and why we're doing this procedure. That's usually the first thing that you read. Then you get into the procedure. So we have a 27-year-old female that has a, a large left ovarian cyst, and they located it via ultrasound. The cyst was measuring up to eight centimeters, and uh, there was thought to be at least one sepitation within that. The patient was having increasing problems with their irregular menses along with increasing left lower quadrant pain. The decision was therefore made to proceed with laparoscopic uh, procedure with the aim of draining the ovarian cyst. The idea is to drain the cyst. Now, why they're not going to remove it? Maybe there's a reason. Uh, it's not for us to know, except for keep close eye on um, whether it changes and they eventually take out the cyst, right? Okay, moving on. Now let's get into the meat of it. What's the procedure that's being done? Uh, we know here that they are draining the ovarian cyst. So I'm going to highlight that. Ooh, I think I got to do it every time. That's the procedure. The first section of your procedure reports is always going to be the setup. You know, uh, they have to, for legal purposes and just documentation standard practice, is they're going to say exactly what's done to the patient, how they were prepped, how it was uh, set up, and then getting into the procedure. So that's what we're seeing here. Patients taken to the operating room and general anesthesia is administered. Now, there will be a separate anesthesia report via the anesthesiologist. They have a separate report. 
Um, okay, and uh, the patient was then prepped and draped, and they talk about the way the patient was uh, set um, uh, positioned. Uh, the bladder was drained. Uh, uh, sometimes when they're doing ultrasounds and things like that, they want the bladder expanded. When they're going and doing the procedure, a lot of times they want to make sure that there's nothing in the bladder. So instead of uh, having the patient get up and down and stuff, they'll just go ahead and make sure it's done with a straight cath. Okay, so uh, what they did is they went ahead and put in a speculum to uh, help uh, visualization of the cervix. And then uh, this is done laparoscopically. Uh, they used a single tooth teneculum, uh, and that is a clamp that has teeth on it. So we can grab. And then don't, this is all fodder. We don't care. When you're coding, this is information that that we don't need. Now, I'm not saying don't pay attention to uh, some of these this wor these words and this verbiage, but for the most part, we don't care how something was grasped unless it, there's a complication or stuff. Whichever tool that they use to do the procedure very seldom is part of our coding process. Now, I'm not saying that it's not. We need we want to know if it's open, laparoscopic, so on and so forth. And that verbiage will tell us a lot. But, you know, if you've got um, one provider uses a single tooth teneculum and another one use something else, that really doesn't matter to us. So know that it's okay when you're going through this process to skim over that information. I call it fodder. Uh, again, cone and cannula, we don't care, but, uh, so they were wanting to manipulate the uterus. They want to get the uterus out of the way. All this stuff's packed in there pretty tight. Uh, let's see, at this point, the gloves were changed and attention was directed towards the abdomen, the umbilical incision. Whenever they do laparoscopic, they're going to stick a hole in your belly button. Uh, it was made to allow, uh, the insertion of the versus, uh, needle. And then this was done without incident. Again, uh, the next thing they do, once they put a hole in your belly button so they can get around in there and they start putting in these additional ports, is they inflate the abdomen with carbon dioxide. They use three liters. Now, when, um, that doesn't go away. You have to actually suck that out. Uh, if they don't get all of it sucked out, uh, then you'll have pain up in your chest, like in your collarbone and stuff. So uh, really nice surgeons will do or try to do a very, very good job of getting all that uh, out of your body. Otherwise, your body just absorbs it. Then we got a trocar was placed through the umbilical incision without incident. Why do you think it keeps saying without incident, without incident, without incident? Because if this is a legal document and if there was ever any complications or anybody came back and said, well, it was a problem and my belly button, you know, herniated, da, 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 after this procedure. Well, it was stating care there was no incident you know everything was fine so it wasn't because of that okay at this point they inspect the pelvis they're in there looking around now immediately apparent was the large simple appearing cyst occupying the majority of the pelvis again eight centimeters is big uh in fact it was impossible to get around the cyst to be able to inspect or identify the remainder of the pelvic organs that is a very big cyst and another reason why they probably didn't try to remove it they're going to uh, drain the fluid out of it at this point a uh, another trocar was placed uh, supra pubically above the pubic bone at time of trocar incision a small puncture was made into the cyst itself clear fluid began draining draining from the cyst cavity they that's good to know right it's not purulent there no complications so they're letting the fluid out into the abdominal cavity and it'll be absorbed by the body or aspirate an aspirator was then placed within the cyst cavity in approximately 150 cc's of absolutely clear fluid was drained from the cyst puncture site was not bleeding once the cyst was deflated, the rest of the pelvic uh, pelvis could be inspected. The uterus appeared normal. The right ovarian and fallopian tubes were visualized and appeared completely normal. This is all just good information. At this point, they're not doing anything else but draining that cyst. On the left side, uh, the other 
ovary was normal. The cyst was found to arise in a paratubular region and was not ovarian in origin. That's good information. Not ovarian in origin. This is not an ovarian cyst. Okay. The cyst was nicely deflated and it was paratubal. Uh, the cyst was not excised. They didn't remove it. That's pertinent. This is all information that changes the way we code. It's confirmed to be hemostatic. Remaining fluid was then aspirated from the cul-de-sac, that little area that everything sits in. The cul-de-sac appeared completely normal. Upper abdominal was inspected and was normal. So they're already in there. They're in the lower abdominal area. If they've inflated the abdomen so they can look it around, they've made it like a big tent, um, uh, they'll go in and just double check everything. They'll check out the appendix. They'll check out the, the gallbladder. They'll you know peek at the liver and so on and so forth because they're already in there. Why not? Appendix was visualized and was also normal. At this point, the procedure was terminated. The suprapudic trocar, trocar was removed. So they start um, taking everything out. The abdomen was deflated, suck out as much as that uh, air as they can. And then they take the trocar out of the belly button. That's usually the largest one. Uh, the incisions uh, were then closed with, and uh, again, always pay attention. You. It, when they're doing wound repairs and stuff, the type of thread that is used, uh, we don't need to in this particular scenario. The vaginal instruments removed, the cervix was confirmed to be all right, and the patient tolerated the procedure well. Everything was doing great at that point. There was no co uh, complications and there was no major blood loss. Okay, now the contents, the fluid that was taken out was sent off and uh, there was no malignancy and it says benign ovarian cyst. All right now this is interesting. What does this tell us? Benign ovarian excuse me ovarian cyst but up here it says not ovarian in origin. So that's like what what do you do? What what does that mean? Well it's very important because the pathologist is the final to one to uh, identify cells. And so they were able to look at the cells and determine what the cells were. That being said, does that change the codes? Hmm, right? All right. Now, let's, now that we've broken this all apart, we know there wasn't a lot that we really needed to pay attention to. We know the post um, was left, large left ovarian cyst. The procedure was laparoscopic drainage. Uh, and it's a very specific type of cyst. Now, in our advanced course, we would go in and um, show you what these cysts look like, have pictures. We'd also let you talk about what's paratubal mean, means around the tube, and, um, you know, get a better idea how laparoscopic procedures were done and talk about the anatomy that we went over. Uh, it's, again, more advanced. Right now, we're just doing uh, a case study where we kind of break down the abstract process and you can get a, an idea of our teaching style. All right, so let's talk about the codes itself. I read it, went ahead and this is coded out for us. And so uh, we don't spend as much time live talking about this. Uh, again, it's going to be staying up so that you have access. You can reference it at any time. And let's see what the codes look like. The first thing is it was a procedure that was done laparoscopically. That is very, very important. Is it an open procedure? Is it a laparoscopic procedure? Is it a laparoscopic procedure that was converted to an open procedure? Those are the questions that you need to ask yourself because that's what the code set allows us to trans, uh, translate for. So we see here that we did a laparoscopic uh, surgical procedure 
And in addition, it was aspiration of cavity or cyst. Now, this is straight out of the code set. And it states, example of ovarian cyst. And it doesn't matter if it was one or multiple. You're going to use the same code. Right? Now, in our BAT technique that Laureen um, created back in 1999, this is what it looks like. Everything after the semicolon, you highlight. And uh, very easy to replicate. Uh, in your manual, just know that with your CPT codes, everything after the semicolon, you're going to highlight so that your eye goes there. So we know that this is in the section of doing laparoscopic procedures, but this particular code, 49322, is different than the others in that it has an aspiration and not just an aspiration, it's of that cavity or and or the cyst. Okay, very, very important. And let's see, uh, then let's look at my favorite area, the ICD codes. Uh, this was a non-inflammatory disorder of the ovary, fallopian tube, and broad ligament, but it's other. When we use the ICD-10 code set, it states that other is defined by you have a diagnosis, there's not a code for it at this time. So the best code for this scenario is other non-inflammatory because there was no indication that it was uh, inflammatory. And this was a problem with the ovary or fallopian tube and broad ligaments would all um, fall under it there, including in N83.8 is available uh, would also cover uh, alanasters or broad ligament laceration syndrome. Okay, um, now let's look here. Key abstracting points. Shanika, are we going over an over uh, delivery one or speaking of global period? We are going to go over a delivery next, and um, the you know what I don't think I'm, um, no, the global period isn't mentioned in the one that we're doing today. Very good point though, Shanika, uh, that you mentioned that. Thank you for bringing that up. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to it. When we're ab abstracting the key points, uh, for a procedure like this is laparoscopic open or converted from laparoscopic to open. And was the cyst removed? So it was laparoscopic, and no, the cyst was not removed. The codes would change if those answers were different. That is our first case. So much fun, right? I really enjoyed that. Now, let's jump over to our second case study, which is going to be a cesarean delivery. I... I mentioned earlier that this is kind of an introduction of how we do case studies and kind of open your eyes so that you can uh, jump off with maybe some questions that you identify as we go through the process and uh, come back and do more research or ask us to assist you with that. We're not getting into an in-depth uh, break it all apart. That's for our advanced course. Uh, uh, we have more time that we spend with this. This is a nice overview. So this is the next case. It's a, de a cesarean delivery. Let's just give that a look. All right. Now it's noteworthy that this particular provider, Dr. Martinez, is going to only do the delivery services and a tubal ligation. Very important. The patient's hometown physician is going to provide the antepartum care and also provided the postpartum care. So, or did provide the antepartum and is going to, to do the postpartum care. This gets very confusing if you're not used to that because you're thinking, wait, wait, who's taking care of what? So that kind of leads to what Shanika was stating. The global period, you know, the the person that's doing this procedure, the cesarean section, is not the same person that took care of the rest of the procedure or the care of the patient. 
Again, uh, we're looking at a patient that is in-house. We have um, the attending and the surgeon is the same provider, Dr. Martinez. Let's do what we did before. Let's break down the preoperative diagnosis. Three prior cesarean section deliveries. What do we know about the abdomen and the uterus if you've had multiple procedures done? And for women of delivering age, especially cesarean sections, you can put it in the chat. What is What do we know happens to the body? And why is it pertinent that the provider has documented this patient has had three prior cesarean section deliveries? Mm -hmm. Right? Mary nailed it. Mary says scar tissue makes it much more complicated. So going in, they know this is not going to be an easy delivery. And um, the way I would say, ah, I, I thought of, <laughs> sometimes I come up with analogies that may not be the best, but picture this. So if you go to a restaurant and you order fried chicken, <laughs> If it's a nice young bird, which most are if they're delivered or if they're bought commercially, right? Um, it's going to be nice and tender. However, if you go and um, butcher your own chicken and it's an old rooster or a chicken that no longer lays, uh, what's the difference going to be in the two uh, end results? It's tough, right? The, the the chicken itself is not going to be uh, as easy to uh, work with. And uh, Shanika also mentioned adhesions, scar tissue, scarring. Devin uh, said also scarring. So this becomes very problematic. That uterus becomes leathery. And um, to have to cut through scar tissue, it doesn't, it, it's not like cutting butter. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had a tough steak? Uh, again, I'll quit that shame on me <laughs> doing those cooking analogies. So we have a lot of adhesions as the body tries to repair itself and compensate. We have scar tissue and scarring. Uh, and we, we think, well, the outside of the abdomen, the skin doesn't look too bad. No, we're not talking about that because you can go above and below a line or cut a different way. We're, not, we're talking about what's inside. And um, so this could be very, uh, very difficult for the provider to get through. Uh, yes. And Cindy makes a point how previous ones were uh, incision wise. So again, did they go lateral, laterally? Did they go, you know, uh, which, which way was the decision? And that's why they make some decisions uh, based on that. Now, the next thing for the preoperative diagnosis is voluntary sterilization. So the patient has decided we're going to go ahead and have a tubal ligation at the same time. Postoperative diagnosis, the provider states that it's same as the pre-op. So that's nice for them to state that so we don't have to overthink that. So what were the procedures performed? They did a repeat lower segment transverse cesarean section, and they did a bilateral Pomeroy tubal ligation. We don't really care that it's Pomeroy. It's a tubal ligation. Now, maybe someday there'll be codes for those multiple types, but right now it isn't, just so you know. Anesthesia, different report. Uh, they did general anesthesia. So what's the history here? Some of this will be pertinent to the uh, sometimes to the codes that we pick uh, in a procedure, and sometimes it won't. So it's very important that you pay attention to what's in that kind of um, area right there. It it tells you why they're doing what they're doing uh, and a little bit of a history behind there. So we have a 30-year-old uh, woman who's a Gravata uh, 4, Para 3, and does anybody know what that means? I bet Shanika does because she's obviously... Uh, uh, had experience with this. The The reason um, they put that in there is it lets you know how many times the patient has been pregnant, four times, how many deliveries and, and babies have um, been delivered, three. Now, after this, it'll be four and four, okay? And they also give the gestational um, 
gestational age. So it's 36 weeks and two days. That is a, a little bit earlier, right? For uh, 40 weeks is, is full term, but usually 38, um, 38 to, to uh, 40 is considered full term. And it says, uh, let's see, so two days gestation, Who? Oh, it was 36 weeks and two days gestation. And they went in and initially went to her hometown um, obstetrician with spontaneous labor. Now, uh, if they're going to do C-section, they usually, uh, and they know they are, and obviously in this scenario, they most likely knew that they were going to do it. Um, they plan ahead, and and it's very common when you've had multiple C-sections you know, if you've never had a vaginal delivery and there's coding for a, a previous C-section to vaginal delivery. But here we knew that this patient's going to be scheduled for a C-section. But guess what? She went at 36 weeks. And so uh, she goes into labor. And if they know you're going to have a C-section and you go into labor before that date, that's a problem. So because of her history with the previous C-sections, he's sending her off to the surgeon. And uh, so they transfer her and thus the surgeon is not involved with the uh, pre and post care for that patient. She's scheduled to have a repeat cesarean section. Uh, she also expressed the desire to do the permanent sterilization and she'd signed all the paperwork for the tubal ligation. So what do we know here? Uh, we're doing sterilization. Let's let's go ahead and highlight that in our codes. Um, and we're doing uh, cesarean, which again, we already know that because that's in the title, right? Uh, let's see. Now, uh, she was sure of her decision for the tubal ligation. Why would you put that in your procedure report? Because it's a legal document and they don't want the patient to come back and say, I didn't want that. Even though I signed the paper, I was too upset and nervous and I was in labor and everything. No, she understood her decision and the provider has stated that she acknowledged that. Uh, when she presented, she was having contractions every two minutes with moderate intensity. That's pretty close together. Uh, if any of you guys uh, have had children before, the cervix was not dilating yet. So this could be for multiple reasons. Maybe the body, it just hasn't kicked in. But if you're having um, contractions every two minutes and your cervix hasn't dilated yet, that's, eh, that's a little wonky. That's not necessarily what you want to see. They know, now if she was not previous C-section and they were, she was going to do a vaginal birth, uh, they probably would have done something to help. Uh, open the cervix. Uh, there's creams and medication that they can use. They can get Pitocin and a bunch of other stuff. And they would just let her labor that out a little bit longer. But no, we can't do that. This patient is going to have a C-section and they don't necessarily want the cervix to open up. So, so far, that's okay, but it's noteworthy. Uh, the uh, cervix isn't dilating. Uh, that With the intensity of contraction, the decision was to go ahead and do a C-section because they might have given her something just to stop the labor. They can do that and say, let's, let's give it another, you know, 24, 48 hours and see if we can get another day in, uh, for the baby. 36 weeks is okay. Um, but again, there a lot of reasons could be, um, uh, part of that. And if you are commonly doing these type of reports, coding them out, you'll see all the, the reasons, you'll know those. So the procedure note, now we've got all of the behind the scenes. We know why they're doing what they're doing. And uh, we know we're doing two procedures. We're going to do a C-section and it's not just any section, it's a C-section after C-sections. And we're going to do the tubal ligation. So what do they do? Let's see what's not fodder in this one. So the patient goes into the operating do, uh, room, they do a spinal. Uh, the patient's then prepped and draped and everything is uh, taken care of. Uh, uh, note, they also do a left lateral tilt. That's pretty common too. Uh, uh, Carmen makes another point, can have complication if born premature. That's true. Note that if there's complications with the baby, the ba that goes on the baby's chart, not on the delivery. Okay. Um, 
keep those if there's a complication to the delivery it's here in this report but once that baby's uh, removed from its mama the baby gets its own chart so they place a foley catheter that's very very common um so they do a uh uh, let's see, a Fannin style skin incision, and they do it superior to the pre-existing scar. Uh, sometimes providers will try to stay right there within the scar that they had. Uh, again, uh, there's a lot of finesse to the way different doctors do what they do and how much time they have to do what they do. But for the most part, they try to keep the abdomen as free of multiple scars as possible. Uh, the uh, that now we're going to um we're going to start breaking down getting into the baby uh, dj you make a good point should spinal procedure have been highlighted we can however um that's part of anesthesia so it's not going to be coded here that's in an anesthesia report very good point to bring up glad you did because i failed to distinguish that so i'm not going to do that and again, anesthesia handles um, the spinal as well as general anesthesia where they put you under completely. It will be, it's got to be noted in the procedure here uh, because they're working as a team, but uh, it will be its own report. So they do the transverse uh, section and, and actually when you when you go in and do these C-sections, they go in layers. So they they take they open up the top layer and then they look to see where they're at. Then they go into the next layer and then they do another layer until they get to the uterus. Uh, so uh, let's see. The fascia was incised, meaning they're getting into the top of that skin. The peritoneal cavity was then carefully entered as the bladder was pulled up quite high anteriorly. So if, if you get the opportunity, you can go online and you can see cesarean sections being done and how they do that. It's not done like you think if you've never seen it done before. And um, what they're going to do is they have to be very careful because when they do this and they um, they go layer by layer, and then the bladder and the uterus um, are right there on top of each other. So they've noted if, any, if anything's going to go wrong, it's going to be a hemorrhage or they're going to nick something. Definitely don't want to cut the bladder. So uh, they find the bladder and they get it out of the way with the retractor. Uh, then a transverse incision is then made in the loader uterine segment. So here's this bulging uterus with the baby in it. And then go down to the bottom of the uterus, not here on top like you would imagine, uh, but down on the bottom. And um, there was delivery of a live born male infant. And then they've got APCAR scores of eight at one minute and 10 at five minutes and weighed five pounds, eight ounces. Now, this information all right here, we want um, live born. That's important to this, but this is all important to the baby, not the mama's chart. Okay. Differentiate that. The APSCAR score, that's the baby. That's all in the baby's chart, not the mama. Uh, uh, also the weight of the baby, that goes on the baby's chart, not on the mama's chart. All we care about is the baby was delivered and the status of the baby when it was born, it was born live. Uh, the baby was suctioned on the table, immediately handed over to the neonatal intensive care team because the baby's, you know, early. Uh, then they have to take care of the placenta. So they remove the placenta and everything, and then they'll inspect it. It appeared to be intact. At this point, the uterus was um, exteriorized to allow for better visualization, meaning they took the uterus out and kind of gave it a once over. The uterine incision was closed and uh, they just did a single running uh, lock layer. And um, this is the type of uh, uh, dissolvable um, thread that they use and everything, hemostasis, everything was good. 
Okay. Again, remember, we're, we're splitting it up. Baby's chart now and mama's chart. Let's see. Sandra says, can we please have a YouTube session on how to code anesthesia? Absolutely. Uh, I think that it was already posted how to do a topic request. Please do that for us so that it gets on the record. Normally, there is an assistant surgeon also. Cindy makes a very good point. Um, they, one doctor uh, surgeon doesn't just go in there and, and do all this. This is, this is intensive. Uh, you know, and you, it, it's, you really need more than one set of eyes. So uh, it is a team that works. You have to have the team for the mama. You have to have the team for the baby. You have to have, um, uh, then you have specialists if it's something's abnormal for the baby and they know, you know, potential abnormal for early. Then we um, uh, have the surgeon, their assistant, and then the, you know, then there's other uh, clinicians that are in there. So it's, it's quite the rigmarole, but they've done it so often that usually they're a well-oiled machine. Everything goes smoothly and they've practiced and they're prepared if anything is not going to happen the way it should. All right, at this point, attention was then directed toward the fallopian tubes. The baby's delivered. That procedure is done. They've taken care of it. Now they're going to take care of the, um, the, uh, uh, for, uh, the, oh, what am I trying to say? Sterilization. Okay, so then they go find the fallopian tubes. Now there are a lot of ways to do this. Uh, so, and, and this is provider preference. Uh, sometimes they talk it out with the, the patient, you know, and I mean, I would want to know how they were going to do it to me, but you know, they'll, they've cut them, they knot them, they clamp them, they solder them. <laughs> I mean, there's just, sometimes they do lots of things, but it's a preference uh, to what procedure they do. So they, both ovaries and fallopian tubes are identified. They look normal. Good to, to note. Uh, they grasp the fallopian tube with a bab, uh, Babcock clamp. They do a bilateral Pomeroy tubal ligation, which is a specific type, and was carried out by uh, tying off of the tube with plain suture and then existing an intervening portion of the fallopian tube bilaterally, excising so they nah, cut it. Uh, good mostasis. We, you definitely want don't want to have a bleed here. Uh, that's how women bleed out uh, when they have an ectopic pregnancy, is at ruptures and they bleed and we don't, you know, they don't catch it uh, and they literally just the abdomen fills up with blood. So then now at this point uh, again, so we know that they did um, bilateral tubal ligation. Let's get that. Okay. Uh, the uterus was replaced within the peritoneal cavity. So the whole time the uterus is sitting there, <laughs> right? They go in, which again, get the uterus out of the way. They can take care of the fallopian tubes, pop that uh, uterus back in there. Uh, pericolonic gutters were uh, sawed free of blood and clots, making sure that they're not going to have any problems there. The uterine incision was once again inspected to confirm that it was okay. So they've already stitched the uterus closed. And again, during this whole time, the uterus is, is starting to clamp down uh, because the baby's gone. So it's going through some major changes as well as having the stitches. Uh, now they're going to start sewing the mama up from the inside out, those different layers. So they close up the fascia, then they close um, the skin. And you know that because of the different types of thread that's being used. Okay. And where it's done. So the patient tolerated the procedure well. They went into recovery in good condition. There was no complications, minimal blood loss. And uh, they went ahead and gave the patient ANSEF, uh, which is um, after they clamped the baby's cord. Standard procedure. So let's look. Uh, DJ says, so does each medical technician, surgeon, and others uh, each have separate codes for their independent claims? No, they do not. No, they don't. Now, if you're in a teaching hospital, maybe and stuff, if there's major complications because it's a team, uh, let's say this was uh, quads, you know, we're, we're having five babies or four babies would be quad. Uh, uh, or is that five? 
I don't know, maybe say, say they're having trouble just to quit messing with my mind. That's what I'm telling myself. Okay, if you're going to have multiple babies and stuff, that gets into teams and that could involve modifiers uh, and stuff. Or maybe they knew that the baby, what if it was conjoined twins? You know, that's going to be a problem. Uh, stuff like that. So, yes, there are incidences where, uh, uh, you know, they will do different reports, but for a standard delivery like this, no, one takes care of it. Very good point. Thank you, DJ, for bringing that up. Cindy says, important to check path report to confirm both tubes were done for verification purposes. Another excellent point. Um, the pathology report would come back and that would be put in the mother's record that uh, that, that was confirmed. So you, you can tell uh, we've got practical application. These people have experience. Mm. And thanks for, for contributing and sharing your knowledge. So what was done? We did a cesarean delivery only uh, by itself would be 59514. You don't, it's not very fancy. Okay. Simple cesarean delivery. 59514. When you say, well, how come it says only? Well, sometimes what happens is they try a vaginal birth. It doesn't work and they revert to a cesarean. Okay. And so there's code specifically for those um, scenarios. We want to tell the whole story. Remember, we're just translating what happened. Next, they did the sterilization. 58611 states that we did uh, tubal ligation and when done at time of cesarean delivery or intra-abdominal surgery. So uh, if they're in there already, then that's telling them, hey, you don't get extra funds for doing a, a ligation like this if you're already in there doing another procedure. <laughs> that's why 58611, if you go look out uh, at what it pays out, it's not going to pay out as much as if the patient came in and that's all they were doing. So you don't get to double dip on the opening up the patient or, or even if it's laparoscopic, that doesn't, that's why it's important. And this code is unique. Again, cesarean delivery what do we do that's all we did was we did a cesarean and then um uh but if we had done uh more like she started out trying to to do a vaginal and we had to convert to a cesarean or you know there's there's a, a list there uh, then and the ligation the tubal ligation it was unique cindy says sterilization is an add-on uh code no modifier excellent also real world uh um note for you guys and then uh dj says that's called double dipping a and then uh no no you're right dj you can't do that and the 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 codes won't allow you to do that the if you pay attention to the nci uh, edits and things okay so now we have very very simple two codes for the procedures but what about the diagnoses this is where Everybody gets a little nervous and um, there's a lot of codes, but really we're taking it step by step and telling the whole story through the diagnoses. Fun stuff. Okay. One at a time. The patient was preterm. That's noteworthy. We know that 36 weeks and um, we even need to know uh, to what extent. So the patient is uh, preterm labor, third trimester with preterm delivery third trimester and there's only one fetus. So there will be that last character tells you if it's how many fetuses, it could be one, two, three, four, five, you can, you can just keep going. So it's 060.14X1 because there's one, one baby. And then we have maternal care for unspecified type of scar from previous cesarean delivery. Okay. Uh, 034.219, that one gets overlooked. Uh, then we have a single life birth, Z37.0. And then last encounter for sterilization, Z30.2. This is the mama's chart. Now the baby will have established their own chart. And um, you'll be coding probably side by side, the baby and or the mama and the baby. It gets when you're first, when you're new at this, it 
kind of can get confusing. Don't overlap those codes and 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 everything. Um, Cindy said that I love diagnose uh, diagnose coding OB. Be, you know what? It is fun, and the reason it's fun is because you literally see this story being told in the diagnoses, right? Uh, and, and, I mean, it's repetitious too. Uh, before you know it, you got these codes practically memorized. I bet Cindy would say. Uh, Let's see. I'm not, I may not say your name right. Tinia, Tinia, Tinia. Why wouldn't you assign 03.11 instead? Well, let me show you. And I just happen to have my encoder up and I'll show you. Excellent question. So let's see. Oh, three, four point two one one. Let's just pull that in so you can see what the code is. I'll give it just a second while it's thinking. It states maternal care for low transverse scar from previous cesarean delivery. Ah, but look, we have um, this one, 034.219, maternal care for unspecified type scar from previous cesarean. They don't tell you what the previous scar was in the report. So they just tell you that it, what type of um, uh, incision they did this time. That it, I don't think in the report that it told us what the previous scar was. Uh, we could double check. Was made superior to the pre-existing scar. So they don't tell us what type it was. That, but they made a transverse incision. Good, good point. What about the weeks of gestation? The weeks of gestation is built into this code right here where it says preterm delivery, third trimester. And um, from that point, uh, everything else gets put on the baby's chart. So Cecilia, another great point. They don't say it's 36 weeks. We just know 36 weeks, third trimester, but it's preterm. So you, you got it, it, 38 to 40 is not, but anything, um, you know, if you know when third term starts, just off the top of my head, I can't remember. And um, you divided it up, you know, in three ways, zero to 12 weeks, 12 to 24, 20, 25. That doesn't seem right. 32. I can't remember. Whew, I should have looked that up. But the good news is if you take the advanced course, we talk about all of that. And we break it all down and give you the information that you need to, to know um, behind the scenes. Thank you, Cecilia. 28 weeks. 28 weeks. So, Any other questions? Uh, uh, the, the abstracting questions for this case would be, did they do the tubal lication uh, uh, report separately? Yes. Within the report, they separated it. Is the history of the previous C-section reported? Yes, they did. And um, is a Z-code required for the tubal ligation? Yes, it is. So those are the main takeaways for this uh, particular one. That being said, remember, if you have a particular question or something you want us to unpack, go over in a live um, uh, webinar like this, our CCO Live, let us know. If you're part of our club, put it in the club and uh, you always get uh, uh, priority that our students. Uh, DJ says, are there software programs on the market to proofread your complete analysis of medical claim and billing before it's finalized to make sure that everything is proper? Yes, there is. And it's called a clearinghouse. They have clearinghouse programs. Um, Cindy, uh, yes, also live birth. Yes, we got that one. And did the advanced class start yet? Mm, it has uh, launched. Sign up tonight at midnight. Is the la It was either last night or tonight was the last day to save uh, that extra $100 on the course. And check out that link. It's going to be fabulous. Carmen, I know you will like it. I know you. All right. Uh, topic request cco.us forward slash topic hyphen request. And I think that's it, guys. Hopefully this was enjoyable and that you learned a lot. I really appreciate uh, Cindy adding her uh, insight 
and uh, those of you others who have also made comments really appreciate that. Uh, one of the great things about our CCO Live is that it is casual, interactive, and we can bounce knowledge off of each other. Um, I know that I learn stuff all the time from watching the comments. Uh, make sure that you double check our other um, platforms. We're on, of course, YouTube, LinkedIn, and you can check, you can find me on LinkedIn as well as CCO uh, Facebook. And now we're on TikTok and Instagram, and we'll start popping out some fun uh, stuff if you were not already following us on those platforms. Tell everybody, if this was helpful for you, share. We advertise via word of mouth. I think that's the best way to do it. Uh, and let everybody know we have that advanced class coming out. We love what we do because we think learning is fun. And uh, uh, so I hope that our teaching style resonates with you. All right, guys, have a great rest of your day. Our online medical coding course was created specifically for beginners to learn everything they need about medical coding. The course includes a personal coach, nine months of access, 24 seven online videos, transcripts and exams. You can learn more about our medical coding course at www.cco.us forward slash PBC.